All right, uh, well, welcome, and I uh, hope everybody's having a great uh, reinvent. Thanks for being here with us. So, one of the most common questions that I get uh, from customers really centers on this idea of like, you know, how do I think about my database investments? You know, it's it used to be a platform choice. Like I would consider two or three vendors. I would pick one. That was my platform. Uh, that was my primary investment. Then I'd start building all my applications on that platform. But today there's there's hundreds of databases to choose from when you really look. And that's pretty hard, you know, to reason. And customers are like, how should I, how should I think about picking the right tool for the right job? And that's really the topic that we're gonna explore together today. So if you leave this session just having a better frame on how to think about these different databases, their purpose, the use cases they support, then we've done our job. Um, so I'm gonna try to cover the, the whole family of databases in the small amount of time we have. We're gonna slip a demo right into the middle. And then at the very end, I'll just have folks come up and join us up front to answer questions. So let's, let's get into it. Um, so if I were sitting down with you and we were talking about databases, this is one of the questions that I'd ask you straight away. What is your database strategy? Some customers that I talk to have a point of view on what their database strategy is. Other customers are actually in the middle of thinking, well, what is our database strategy going forward? And then, and then everything in between. But what I find in this question is two areas of focus almost always come up in almost every conversation I have. And those two fundamental areas that emerge are really around lift and shift, you know, how do I think about lift and shift, moving from on-premise into the cloud? The second thing that comes up is how do I think about new database or inve uh, database investments in new apps? Because that's, that's a very different thing than it, than it was in the past and how people built their applications. So let's take a closer look at lift and shift. So when I get into discussion around lift and shift, typically what's happening is somebody's got a set of applications that they've already built. They don't have budget to rewrite those applications. They're trying to find ways to free up budget. And one of the things that they start looking at is, hey, if I can move some of my existing applications into a cloud, can I get some sort of return that frees up budget that I can invest in other places? I can start innovating. And that's basically what the discussion is in its shortest form. But in that, what I often hear from customers is this, uh, this notion of, hey, I, I actually really want to move off of these old guard commercial databases. I typically don't even have to ask why, because what they'll continue to tell me just yesterday, I was having lunch with somebody. I didn't even know him. I just sat down, sat next to somebody, asked him what he did for a living. And he started telling me that, hey, I, you know, we uh, build a, a financial payroll thing in small, medium-sized business. Uh, we're trying to actually move off of this commercial database. I'm trying to free up some dollars so I can take that money and reinvest it back into building new parts of my application. That's, that just happened yesterday. Now what comes next is, you know, I don't want to be stuck, I don't want to be stuck with punitive licensing terms. These licensing terms change on me to change my behavior. That doesn't work for me. Um, I'm really thinking about moving over to, to open source. Like that's a thing that we want to do. In this case, this particular gentleman told me, he's like, we want to move to Aurora right away. So when you think about that comment, going from commercial like Oracle or SQL Server to something on open source, the next thing that I typically hear is, hey, we've been experimenting with open source on premise. It's actually hard to get this to perform the way we need it to. But this is basically why we built Amazon Aurora. So Aurora really gives you the performance and availability of commercial with the cost effectiveness of open source. It's really the simplest way to think about it. With Aurora, you'll see often five times the performance of standard MySQL, three times the performance of Postgres, all with the security availability and reliability of commercial grade at about a tenth of the cost. 
This is really why Andy is always showing up at reInvent and talking about Aurora being one of the fastest growing services in AWS. Now, I also talk to a lot of customers that basically starts with, hey, I re I've got legacy apps. I want to improve the uh, performance and scale. I want to free up resources to innovate. And a lot of folks running commercial databases will first move into RDS. And they'll move into RDS because RDS is just going to automate a lot of time-consuming tasks that many of you probably do on your own premise. I don't know that I need to go through what all of that means, but the net is, is when you're not doing provisioning and managing servers and setting up HA, you get that time back to invest in other things. The other thing that a lot of customers benefit from on this lift and shift category is using tools like DMS. DMS is, a, is an excellent tool, and a, I've seen some big, big enterprises take full advantage of this. And the tooling is not really meant to just, it's not like point a tool at, at uh, a source and then point it at a destination and everything is just gonna get sorted out. But these tools are getting better and smarter every day. I often think of these tools like having an army of consultants by your side, through that, that knowledge through the form of a software. So if you're looking to move from uh, SQL or Oracle or something like MySQL or Mongo into AWS, I would encourage you to check out DMS. A lot of folks, it saves folks a lot of time and money. All right, so let's shift gears and take a look at how customers think about database investments for new apps. This is very different than how things used to be. This is really the crux of why we're here right now. So if you think about modern apps, these modern apps create all new requirements than what we might have been used to 10, 15, 20 years ago. So for example, if you think about some of the largest cloud applications today, you'll know, you know such as like ride hailing, media streaming, social media, dating, you'll, you'll notice some common characteristics. Millions of users located all over the world. Everybody's expecting a near instant experience which could translate to predictable sub millisecond performance. These systems need to scale on the fly. So this whole idea of a one-size-fits-all database, that doesn't work anymore. Instead, developers are doing what they do best. They take these giant applications, they break them into smaller parts, and then they pick the right tool for the right job. Why do they do that? Most developers say the same thing to me. I do not want to trade off functionality, performance, or scale. So they take a big app, break it into smaller parts, and pick the right tool for the right job. If we went and looked at any of these large modern applications, looked at the architecture behind the scenes, you're not gonna see a platform or one database supporting it. You're gonna see most of the customers that are going down this path, what they're doing is using the right tool for the right job. So it's a variety of purpose-built engines. Why? Because they don't wanna trade off on functionality, performance, or scale. Okay, so if you think about common data categories and use cases, this, this one slide is the one that almost everybody I show it to takes a picture of because it's a different way of thinking about things. Um, I am personally not a big fan of this NoSQL or non-relational, relational or NoSQL. I actually don't think that helps the mental model of anything. What I see from customers and developers is they think about a family of databases. And they're not competing with each other, they're complementing each other. So if, when we think about a family of databases, all we have done here is just listed out some common categories, along with the purpose of the tool in that category, along with some common use cases. The use cases is not an exhaustive list, it's just to give you an idea. So instead of looking at a list of two, 300 databases, I found when people just kind of turn it on its side and think about these categories, then when you're thinking about how do I pick the right tool for the right job, it really starts with the use case and the access pattern, and then you pick the tech. The, the way it used to be was pick the tech, 
then go figure out how to do the use case. And that's not the world we really live in anymore. All right, so let's take a closer look at three of these. I'm gonna get a little more detailed as we go now. Okay, so let's look at relational key value and graph. Now the reason I'm picking these three, it's not just a random collection, is I actually think this really illustrates how databases have gone from platform to more specialized over time. So relational really emerged in the 70s. Most of us are quite familiar with it because it's been around for multiple dec decades. But key value is an example of a new thing. You know, that starts to emerge in the 2000s. Graph really starts to emerge in the last 12 to 18 months. I don't think it's a coincidence that these more specialized databases are emerging at the same time these modern cloud apps are. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that's the reality of what these new apps need, purpose-built engines. So if we look at relational, I'm going to assume most of us are familiar, but just to recap, if you think about sort of the purpose of relational and the access pattern, this is really about modeling or breaking data amongst tables, so I don't have the same data over and over and over and over. You know, if you think about it, when relational first came along, storage was a premium, so if you kept an address for a hospital a thousand times over, and you had to change the address, it's like a thousand updates, whereas if I just put it in a hospital table, give it a key, it's one update, I'm using less storage. But the reality is with these systems, when I talk to developers, it usually sounds like this. I don't know all of the questions that are gonna be asked of this data. But what I do know is when somebody wants to ask a question, perform some ad hoc query, that that must be, that data that comes back must be high integrity, very consistent, and I need that system to make sure that that referential integrity is preserved. So in this particular case, I get a bunch of data accuracy and consistency. If you look at just how you might query that, like in this case, we've got, you know, we're using a very simple schema here. We modeled a patient, a doctor, a hospital, visits, and medical treatments. Pretty simple. We've got some keys that connect these things together. So somebody can't go delete a table. The system won't let that happen. But if I asked a question like doctors affiliated with a particular hospital, pretty straightforward for a developer. You know, select from where statement, the things that meet that particular condition, I get the results set back. But I can trust that that data is consistent that I'm looking at. I might ask something a little more. I might say, hey, I'd like to know, imagine if we were, had a, we were uh, an insurance company and we wanted to know the number of patient visits each doctor completed last week. Well, the developer that was implementing the query to answer that question for us might write something like that. You know, where I select from where and then I group by. That's kind of the access pattern. I get this awesome integrity on the data that I'm looking at. Now, as we all know, I've seen this uh, many a times, like if you overburden, you can overburden any database. You just ask it to do more than it was supposed to do. And that's where things start to, you know, that's where things start to get in trouble. But when you use them for their purpose, they can do awesome. This is what relational does well. Okay, so now let's look at key value. So key value is all about the simple key value pairs. It's all about, you know, horizontal partitioning. It's all about consistent performance at scale. So if you and I were building a video game app and uh, we had, uh, we were like, how many users are we gonna have? Mm, it could be 100,000, it could be 100 million, but no matter what it is, we need consistent performance at scale. Could you imagine if we built a video game and the thing stopped scaling? Like these players today, boom, they're gone one click away, they're off to the next game. We can't afford that. So that's why a lot of folks think about key value in these use cases where you need per, very consistent performance at scale, a very flexible model. And if you look here in the middle, you know, the, the, you know, the, the language or the, the way a developer would interact with the system is pretty straightforward with puts and gets. On the right is just a very simple gamer's table with the primary key and a set of attributes. 
But let's look at how you might access data. So in this access pattern on the right, we have a gamer's table. We try to keep this really simple just so we get through this quickly, but you'll see on my primary key, a gamer tag, look at hammer 57 there. And then under type, there's rank, status, weapon. And if you look at status, health, and progress, imagine if we built a video game and part of our application logic needed to quickly understand the current health of a player in real time as the game's being played. So that's a really simple get, go give me that data. That query might look that easy, where I go get from the table gamers, this key, the type status, and that's what the system is gonna pull out, just that. It's a very simple get, and it works fast, extremely fast. Or, you know, if it's one of those situations where we need all of the data associated to a particular gamer, gamer tag, that's what the query would look like. And in this particular case, we're gonna go pull back all of that data. But the real magic in this is how you can partition this data very easily for this very simple put get access pattern. And regardless if we had 10 users, 10 million, or 100 million users, this system's gonna perform the same. Now if we look at graph, graph is really about highly connected data. You know, where, where relationships are first class uh, objects. They have attributes, they can be queried and indexed. So in this very simple drawing, uh, there's vertices in a graph, others call them nodes, vertice, graph, vertex, it just means the same thing. So in this case we have some uh, customers uh, and categories like product and sport. And then there's edges. And edges are the connections between these nodes that can have attributes on them. And this is effectively what you're querying. So what do I mean by this? So let's say, for example, uh, we were working on uh, an app. And in the app, we wanted to do something like a product recommendation. So in this case, in, if we were using a graph, which is its purpose is about highly connected data in this sort of use case, let's say here we've got Bill, uh, Emit, and Kevin as customers. We have product and sport as categories. Those are our vertexes or nodes. Bill has purchased product, Emit has purchased product, Kevin follows a sport, those, are, those connections are our edges. And then Sarah shows up in the system. Sarah follows sports. Sarah goes to make a purchase from products. And we want to basically show her that customers who also follow sports purchase these items. That's what the Gremlin query would look like to do that. So instead of writing hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of lines of code, in a database whose purpose isn't about traversing these types of relationships, that's what I mean by using something in a way that it really wasn't designed for. A lot of folks can try to do these workarounds and try to figure things out, but remember, I always hear from our customers, I do not want to trade off functionality, performance, and scale. I do not want to spend all my time on these workarounds. I just need the thing to work. And in this particular case, that's the query, very simple query to do a product recommendation. Or the other common use case here is a friend recommendation. So if you look over on the right, uh, Mary shows up as a customer, uh, Emit uh, knows Mary, Emit knows Kevin. Now the system can say, hey, do you know? Like you could think of a friend recommendation in this context. Uh, that's what the query looks like for that. So it's, it's relatively straight simple. Once you get versed with it, then off you go. But the reality is I'm just showing really simple things right now. Now imagine a graph with millions of nodes and all the associated edges and attributes. So when you write that query, you want that system to run extremely fast. Now if you take one step back, and we look at a couple of customer examples. Uh, Airbnb, most people are familiar with Airbnb. Airbnb has a 
awesome engineering team. And the Airbnb is not a, it's, a, it's an experience to us as the users of it, but they're, they break that down into all these smaller parts and they absolutely pick the right tool for the right job. In this case, they'll use DynamoDB or key value uh, for search history because they're dealing, they need super fast lookups. Uh, they'll use ElastiCache uh, for session state and this allows them sub millisecond, you know, page rendering. Uh, and they'll use RDS uh, for, as, the, as part of their transactional data. So oftentimes when you hear that, it, you could think of the time where you're ready to give a credit card and this could be modeled in a certain way. That's Airbnb. Another really fun one is Duolingo. I just met a reporter yesterday. I was doing an interview with her. Uh, uh, she was from Japan and she uses Duolingo uh, uh, for language learning. And we were on this topic and I said, hey, you know, if you think of Duolingo, uh, Duolingo, uh, which is a language learning uh, platform, and they do, I think they offer 80 different languages across 300 million total users doing 7 billion exercises per month. So they break that app into smaller parts. They're using DynamoDB for item tracking, to see which language exercises were completed. They're using Aurora for their primary transactional database for user data. And then they're using ElastiCache um, as a caching layer to speed up descriptions and learning around keywords such as the, and, and it. So it's one thing to talk about how developers will, will take big things and break them into smaller parts. Uh, pick the right tool for the right job. There's nothing better than seeing an actual demo. So, Joe? Thank you very much, Sean. So what we're going to do is take what Sean has been talking about. We're going to put it into practice with some live running code. And what we've built for you today is a web application, e-commerce site that, that sells books. Perhaps you've used one of these before or are familiar with this, this type of scenario. And what we're going to do is we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of the developers building this site when we built this out. And we're going to look at four different use cases. And then we're going to kind of rationalize, you know, what is the use case, what is the data model, and what is the right tool for that particular job. Uh, and then, you know, we'll summarize. So the four use cases we're going to look at today are a product table, you know, and similar with the shopping cart and orders table. That will be the first experience. The second one is a product search. The third is a leaderboard. And the fourth is a recommendation engine. So let's get into it. So the first use case we're going to look at is our product table. And that's really the metadata that describes you know, these books that you see uh, on the screen right now. So for that, let's go look at what this data is actually modeled as. And I'm going to pick on the book um, carbs today. And there it is. Now, if we look at this data model, the book has a unique identifier, right? And that's a GUID, and I think that's a pretty standard practice. And it has a number of attributes, the author, the category, the name, the price, the rating, the S3 bucket where the image resides. And it's a self-contained document. So you know, this, this particular data model lends itself really well to a key value store. And why I chose DynamoDB for this particular use case is I only have 62 books in my, my website right now. But if I have 10,000, 100,000, 10 million products and customers, I want the access pattern to this particular, um, this particular document to be consistent and have the same performance whether I have thousands or millions. And that's what key value is really good for. So let's modify this. We'll make this. Uh, Carbs Vegas style, so we'll add a new book to our product table. Of course, anything in Vegas is expensive, but delicious, so we'll give it a five rating. Uh, and we'll save that. Uh, we need a unique identifier. And we'll save that to our table. So we'll go back to our demo app. We'll look at cookbooks, and then we'll go try to find Carbs uh, Vegas style. There it is right there. But what I just did is, is not how I expect my customers to search for books, right? I think we've all become very accustomed to a really great product search experience. Instead, I expect my customers to go up here, 
uh, in, in search. And there's the book we just add, Vegas Cards and you know, 2998. Now when I thought about choosing the data store that's gonna power the search experience, you know, this is the one area where I didn't want to compromise on functionality. I don't want to, as a developer, I tell you the last thing I want to do is build full text search, uh, faceting, ranking, and autocomplete into a database that doesn't have it. That's just a bunch of reinventing the wheel, um, not a good use of my time. I'd rather be building uh, other experiences for my customers. So I chose Amazon Elastic Search Service because that's its purpose. It does really well at full text search. Now you might be asking yourself, but Joe, you just wrote to a table in DynamoDB, but you just told me you just searched for this new book you just had in Elastic Search Index. How did you keep those two databases in sync, or what did you do behind the scene to make that happen? Let me show you. DynamoDB has a really great feature called Streams, and it's available on all tables. So I'll create a new product table. And this and we'll create that. And for the streams, I'll enable it for this particular table when it's set up. What it allows me to do is every time that I insert, modify, or delete an item in my particular DynamoDB table, it's gonna write it to the stream, or if you wanna think about it as a queue. So with that queue, I can then associate a trigger, which is a lambda function. And we'll have a batch size of one so that every time I write to that table, it's going to trigger off that Lambda function. It's going to go right into my Elasticsearch index for me. So that's me pushing this functionality down into the native capabilities of the service so that I don't have to do this in my application tier. All right, so the third experience we want to look at, we have the basics, right? We have a product table, and we have a search experience. The third use case I want to look at is a leaderboard. And why a leaderboard? Well, because I want my customers to be able to access the most relevant content on my site, and relevancy is sometimes measured by the most items that have been purchased. This is similar to the Billboard Top 100 or New York Times bestseller list. So here's my bestseller list. I have three items in it. Um, so when I think about picking the database for this particular use case, I'll tell you what I don't want to do. I don't want to write a query that has to do a full table scan of my orders table, a group by, a summation, and an order by every time a customer comes to this particular website. Why is that? Because I expect to get a lot of orders on my website, and that query performance is gonna get slower as the number of orders I have in that table increases. That's gonna be, so basically the more successful the site becomes, the slower this becomes. That's not a good scenario. So when we thought about picking the, the tool for this job, we used Amazon Elastic Cache for Redis. And why Redis? Redis has an extremely useful in-memory data structure called a sorted set that makes it really easy to build use cases and scenarios like this. So let me show you what that looks like. So I have a terminal right now that's actually connected to the Redis uh, cluster that's powering this demo application. And a sorted set is just, it sounds, it is exactly what it sounds like, uh, and this is the query for that. So books all time is the sorted set, I'm going to query from 0 to 10. I only have three items in there. And I'm going to show you the scores. Right? And that's the data structure that I'm pulling back. Now, when I add an item to this, uh, this in-memory data structure, it's just going to update you know, the GUID is the book, and then it's going to update the quantity. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, let's see, what are we at? If we want to pop the last book up to the very top, uh, we have 34 for Scream Ice Cream. So we. If we add 15 books or 12, we'll be good. So let's, let's buy that, and let's pop this up to the top. Now, what we should expect happened, and, and similar to what I did with Elasticsearch, every time I write to my orders table, I have a similar Lambda function that goes and writes it to my sorted set. Still have all my orders in my orders table, but I have this really simplified data structure that keeps track of uh, my sorted set for me. So if we go back to our best sellers, ice cream's on top. We can go query this data structure again, and now we see we went from last to first, and we have 46 items. So every time a customer comes to my website, it's that simple of a query, um, and it's incredibly useful. All right, so the fourth experience is a recommendation engine. 
Now, the one that we're showing right here and why we want a recommendation engine is we know if a colleague recommends a book to us or we see it sitting on a friend's table, that has meaning to us. It increases our likelihood to buy that book because there's some social validation there. So what this, this recommendation engine is showing right here is like, hey, these are the other friends that have bought in this book, um, and, and that's a really great uh, tool for our, for our website. Now, I'm a very visual learner, so let me show you what this graph looks like. Right? This is the social graph that's powering this demo application. And as Sean talked about, these circles are the vertexes. The dark blue ones are people, the light blue ones are books, and the orange ones are categories. So we can see here is this particular person purchased this book, which was also purchased by this particular person, and you know, they know other people, and this is what a social graph looks like. Why I like to visualize this as a developer is it actually helps me write queries a lot more efficiently because I can you know, match it with what the actual structure looks like. So let's do that. The next experience I want to add is when I click on, I haven't built this yet, but this is the next one I'll do when, when I get time. When I click on this book, I also want to present the other books that people have purchased that has also bought in this book. I think we're familiar with this experience. If you bought in this one, you might like these five too. So let me show you how I'd write that, uh, that query in, in Gremlin, right? So this is, our, this is our graph, and we're gonna start with Vertex 34. This is just a simplification of the book that we clicked on. And from there, this first line of code is basically saying like, given this vertex, I want you to go out and I want you to find out all the other people that have purchased this, right? So that's the first traversal. So it's just going out and saying, hey, who has purchased this? The second line of code right here is saying, okay, now that we're at those people, right, now that the people vertex is, what other items did they purchase? We're gonna remove the item that we're referencing, and then we're gonna order by uh, the ratings of those books decreasingly, so we get that top list uh, for our social recommendation engine. So I already have a console set up with Neptune. I'm gonna run this query, and then I get that performant uh, result set back with just a little bit of code. And this is a great example, again, of just using the native functionality of the database. It's not that complicated to write these queries. Um, again, I don't wanna try to write this query in SQL. Uh, it's a disaster. So with that, let me switch it back over and summarize really quickly. So what we did is we decomposed an application. We picked the right tool for the job. We chose a key value store in DynamoDB for our product table. We chose a graph database for our product recommendation engine. We chose an in-memory store in Elastic Hesh and Redis for our leaderboard. And we chose, chose Amazon Elastic Search Service for our product search. But wait, there's more. That demo application that you saw that I ran today, that's available today. It's up on GitHub. Uh, and we created a one-click uh, cloud formation template. So you can get this up and running in your own account, uh, just a one-click, one and you can go ahead and explore and have fun and extend and, and, and look at these different databases. So with that, I really appreciate your time, and thank you. All right, thank you. All right. It's pretty fun stuff. A lot of people worked on that demo. In fact, we did this talk last year at the very end. The, uh, we got a bunch of feedback. Hey, that demo, can you build it such that we can download it, play around with it, et cetera, and, and the team uh, pulled it all together. So thank you for that. OK, so let's take a look at Ledger Database. It's a whole new category. Then we'll look at time series. Then we'll summarize and be done. All right, uh, just by raise of hands, how many people are familiar with the Ledger database? Well, not a lot of us, some of us, okay. Um, I'm gonna try to cover some key concepts here, show you how it works, talk about use cases, uh, and let's see where we get. Okay, so as it, as it relates to use cases, what I can tell you is this. I did not have a customer come up to me when we started this project and say, hey, I need a ledger database. Nobody said that. Instead, what customers were saying was things like this. Hey, uh, boy, it'd be great if the data was immutable. It just can't be changed. It'd be great. Uh, it would be great 
if that data was immutable and could be cryptographically verifiable. I have supply chain scenarios where, you know, I need to be, actually be able to trace the source of something, like a, like a, it could be a recalled product, for example. I need to be able to trust the lineage of that data, that it hasn't been changed. That's what the conversation would sound like. Or in healthcare, it could be, uh, oftentimes when you uh, sell a medical device, you have to keep record of who you sold it to. You have to keep record of when it was serviced. If you sell it to somebody else, you have to keep record. And in that context, you'd hear, gosh, it'd be great if, 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 the, if the data was immutable and cryptographically verifiable so that if we needed to go look at the lineage of that data, we could follow it and know that it hasn't been changed. Another example would be, in, in, uh, think of a DMV scenario, car registrations. Gosh, it'd be great, all these car registrations and uh, tracking titles and registered owners. Boy, wouldn't that be something? Like, if you've ever looked at a Carfax, have you ever wondered when it said five owners? Have you ever wondered to yourself, I wonder if that car really has had five owners? Like, who validated that? That's what we heard. And it turns out within Amazon, Several years ago, we used to say this to ourselves, like, think of, think of the uh, control planes that sit behind EC2 and S3. Just think of how much activity, event activity is happening there. You know, like, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we had a, you know, this would really help us in a variety of scenarios where we could kind of have uh, the, uh, the date of all the control plane events and know that it hasn't been changed. So we actually started building ledger technology several years ago. But it wasn't until the last year and a half that customers started talking to us, just like I shared with you. And the union of those two things led to, gosh, I think people are really asking for what we call today a ledger database. So the challenges that we heard from customers center on just a couple of dimensions. One. If somebody made a platform choice or was trying to sort of audit changes in a database using a relational database, we would hear this. Hey, it's kind of hard to actually build an audit table for a variety of reasons. It's not that creating the table is hard. It's the, oh, no, we've got to write this stored procedure. We might have to write that trigger. What happens if something does change in the audit table? How do we keep track of it? If we're auditing too much, did the application just slow down? Maybe we should audit less. Then the second aspect we heard is this notion of, hey, even if I am trying to audit, it's impossible to verify. Impo it's very hard. Customers say, I don't, have, I don't have a clear way to prove that super user didn't log in and just change the data. It's really hard for me to do that. The other thing we heard from customers is around blockchain. Some customers need distributed consensus. Like imagine all of us in a room observing things and recording what we saw happen. You know, that's a very simple way of articulating distributed consensus. But we don't know each other, and the great thing is if we did need distributed consensus and we were all recording things, then you could imagine the algorithm you could write to prove like, hey, actually that transaction did or didn't happen. But a lot of customers say, you know what? I don't need 500 people I don't know in a room observing what I'm doing, I don't need distributed consensus. That's not, that's not my use case. But I do need, I do need that, cryptogra or that complete verifiable cryptographic way to watch and track data changes. I don't need to set up an entire blockchain environment just for that. But I do need this ledger thing. Now, let's look at some fundamental key concepts of a ledger database. So I know this is a new category, and I'm just going to use drawings to try to articulate this. So as a developer, this is, this, these are the key concepts to just think about. One, you create a ledger. When you create a ledger, it's serverless in, in, in the context of QLDB. Uh, so there's no servers to manage. But a ledger has a key component, and that key component is called the journal. And when you record a transaction, so if I use a car registration example, like imagine registering a car to a particular owner, let's call that the transaction. When I perform that transaction, I write it to the journal. 
And a transaction is actually stored in a block on that journal. And once a transaction is written to that journal, the data cannot be changed. That's what we mean by immutable. Like you can't go back to a block and change data in it, you can't update it. If you, if you execute a transaction and you accidentally did something wrong, like you, you registered a car to the wrong owner, the only way to correct it is with a new transaction that doesn't update on the owner. So once written to the journal, the data is immutable. It can't be chained. And each of those little blocks, just think of the transaction as the input, the output as a little hash that goes along with it. I'm just trying to oversimplify this. OK, so the journal determines what we call current, uh, current state or history. What do I mean by that? So think of like a bank scenario. Think of debit, credit, debit, credit, debit, credit on the journal. And then as a developer, you want to query, what's my current account balance? That's what we mean by current state. H for history is this really cool concept. So um, typically what happens is, OK, I, I can wrap my head around debit, credit, debit, credit, debit, credit on J, current state, OK, account activity. But what if I wanted to see the past 30 days? Or I'm sorry, C for current state of my account balance. But what if I want to see the past 30 days of, of account activity? So in our system, it's just a table that's created by default that allows you to just quickly query account history. So just think of it like that. All right. So the ledger comprises C, H, and J. And J determines C and H. So you can blow up C and H, and you can get it back with J. I hope that makes sense. I'm trying to really simplify this. Now let me show you an example of how a ledger database works. OK, so the scenario is this. You and I are working together at the DMV. Our assignment is to build an application that is recording registrations, which we've all been doing already. But what's different? is we're going to record the transactions in a, in a ledger database, specifically on that journal. Why? Because we want to make sure that we have a complete cryptographic verifiable way to just follow that data lineage. OK, so here we go. So we create a ledger. And when we create that ledger, there's a basically, think about it, like an empty journal that you see on the bottom. We create a, a current.cars table. And then we have an associated history.cars to go along with it. So just think about it like that. And now we want to register our first car. So if you look in the upper right, that's our super complicated insert script. And uh, this is, uh, what are we? We're inserting into cars, manufacturer, Tesla, model, Model S, year 2012, VIN. And the owner is Tracy Russell. So as a developer, that's what I write. When I execute that, what happens? The transaction is written into a block on the journal. And when I write that transaction into the block, if you see the data inside of that block, think of that as the input. We run that through a hashing algorithm and then a hash is associated to that data. And then, from a developer point of view, if I go query current.cars, I'd see Tracy Russell as her current owner. And then, of course, in the history table that's associated to it, there's just one version of the doc. Now let's, just, let's, let's show uh, a sale of the car. So in this case, we're going to, uh, from cars, where VIN equals the numbers that you see there, we're going to update the owner to Ronnie Nash. OK, so when I execute this, what's going to happen? We're going to write that transaction into a block on the journal. So remember that journal, it's append only. We're not going back and updating the first block. It's a new transaction. Uh, that's the input. It gets a hash. There's a pointer that connects the two. And now when I go and query current.cars, I see Ronnie Nash is the owner. 
And how many versions of the doc do we have in the system now? You're right, two. So if I needed to query the history of, hey, can you show me the previous owners of this vehicle? That's how you do it. Now, just to complete this, let's say we saw the car one last time. And in this case, it's just an update uh, for the owner. When I execute that update, what happens? I write a transaction into a block. It gets a hash. There's a pointer that connects. Now when a developer queries current.cars, I see Elmer Hubbard is the current registered owner. And if I go look at the history of the registered owners for that vehicle, you'd see I have three versions of the doc. So that, in its essence, is how a ledger database works. Now, one question I get from a lot of customers that have heard this cryptographic verification and immutable part for the first time sounds like this. Hey, could you tell me one more time how that data is immutable? And what I point them to is on the journal, that first block. And then I say, hey, if you look at like the owner, Tracy Russell, uh, the VIN and whatnot, like once you write that to the block, you, this database, you don't go back and change the data there, you just write a new transaction, which is recorded as a new block. And this is when people go, oh, OK, I think I now understand what you mean by immutable. And then they go, hey, could you tell me one more time, what do you mean by that cryptographic verification? Like, what does that mean? It's not that the data on the journal is all encrypted. It's that the message, that transaction, goes through a secure hashing algorithm, and it gets hashed. Now you have a digest. You could publish that digest. And then if somebody ever came up to you and said, hmm, well, I think you might have changed that data. I don't trust you. Then if you had a published digest, then you could say, OK, let's take a look at the transaction. Let's look at the digest republished. You can run the hash against the same data I'm showing you. If the hashes match, you know that data has not been changed. So that's the real power of a ledger database. The last thing I'll talk to somebody about, if, I, if they're giving me that look, you know, it's like, hey, See where it says owner Tracy Russell in the first block? If you just change that capital T to a lowercase t and, and, and submit it and rehash, it's a completely different hash. And this is when people go, OK, now I get it. All right, so, so we're excited about introducing uh, QLDB. Uh, we've had a lot of fun uh, working on this project uh, in terms of, you know, really the things to remember here is the data that you store in here, it's immutable, cryptographically verifiable. The system is very easy to use. Uh, and we're excited what we can get done here. All right, now let's look at time series. So one of the things that we get on time series is what is time series data again? Could you remind me of what you mean by that? So time series data is basically a sequence of data points recorded over an interval of time, such as what is the weather? How's, what's, the, what's the temperature over time? What's the stock price over time? Some people call that regular time series data. Time series data is also, if you think of an Amazon fulfillment center, a machine turned on or off. I care about how that, those changes over time. Door, open, close. Or uh, I care about this a lot. Item picked, item packaged, item shipped. I definitely care about how that changes over time, because if I have billions of events like that, I need to tune this environment in near real time. So I want to capture that time series data. But the next thing a lot of people ask is, like, what's so special about a time series database? In other words, what they really mean is, if I can record a timestamp, isn't that just time series data? No. <laughs> Those that laughed, I, I know. Uh, Time, what makes a time series database special is time is the single primary axis of the data model. So x can be one thing and one thing only is time. And when you have that assumption in the system, it just basically allows you to specialize and optimize the whole stack from ingest to storage to query. Like you know in query, you're always querying over time. There's a lot of things you can do to optimize the system. From a use case perspective, there is a wide range of time series data use cases. For almost all customers I'm talking to, in one way, shape, or form, they're talking about, gosh, how do I analyze data as it changes over time? You know, I have aspects of this all over my business, and it's not just IoT sensors. It's also in application events, like heavily instrumented applications. 
DevOps data, and so on and so forth. The challenges we heard from customers when trying to build time series workloads, it really is, hey, I tried to do this thing in a relational database, but it, 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 like, I, it's, it's kind of unnatural for, I don't need a rigid schema. In fact, I don't even know, what, I, might, I might have a set of sensors on a robot, I might want to collect a certain amount of attributes, but I might want to change that on the fly. I'm not trying to model out my entire IoT environment out of the gate. I definitely need that kind of flexibility. And if I need to start collecting attributes on a sensor, I need that to happen now. I do not. Also, another common thing in time series, a uh, customer that I met with, we were talking about time series, customer says, gosh, you know the one thing I have a problem with is interpolating missing data points. For whatever reason, uh, there's a connection, uh, it might fail, what have you, I'm missing data points, I need to interpolate. If you go to Stack Overflow and just search up, when you get a chance, how do I interpolate a missing data point using SQL? You'll find folks sharing uh, sometimes eight, 900 lines of code as an example, but in a time series database, that's exposed just as a function. Think of it like a function key on a calculator. You should just, a developer should just say, hey, using this series, interpolate uh, interpolate the missing data points using this series. It should be a single line of code and off you go. Those are the kinds of things that you should be able to do in time series database. And then the other thing we hear with existing time series, fully managed solutions out there, I, I consistently hear about scale constraints. For example, I had a customer tell me, hey, uh, one of these fully managed time series solutions out there uh, when it fills up with data, it literally will start purging data by default. The other option I have is to actually just turn off ingest. So the, uh, the point that I wanted to make there is the volume of data with these types of workloads is off the charts. And when you think about a huge volume of data, you don't want to keep all of that high resolution data in memory all the time. You might for 30 minutes while you're diagnosing something but with a policy, you want to be able to very simply move that data from in-memory, maybe to a warm tier. You might downsample that data. You might actually want it to just gracefully end up in, in cold storage that's really cheap. Why? Because if I have a dashboard and I'm troubleshooting something on the spot, I see vibrations on a particular machine, I might also want to see, hey, what, did the vi what was the average vibration on this for the past 12 months? That should just be a simple query to a developer. And managing that whole life cycle of data is not something you should be doing as a full-time job. It should just be a policy. So this is why we built TimeStream. Really excited about it. Um, this is designed architecturally to really have no scale limits. Uh, the performance, uh, we're excited about the performance. You know, we, we, we believe you're gonna be able to um, uh, collect data at the rate of millions of inserts per second, process that data very quickly. Uh, we'll have built-in functions to help you with interpolation, extrapolation, smoothing, approximation. And then of course it's serverless. This is the one big thing that we heard a lot of customers like, you know, when we first started on this journey, they would show us pictures and these, they, it was like build, it was just things all over the place just trying to create a time series database. Here, you just create an endpoint and start writing. All right, so let's summarize. Um, so again, when you think about the choices, uh, our family of databases is represented across the page. You know, we have a very, you know, I think some would argue it's, you know, our. It, we have a really good relationship with our customers and an understanding of how to scale these systems. You know, our roadmap is 90% driven with our customers. What you see on this uh, page is a reflection of that relationship. A common question I get from customers is, hey, what, what's coming next when we show up to reInvent next year? What's the new category? And a question I almost never get is what's not going to change on this picture? And we want to invest in those things. For example, I don't think a customer is going to come up to us and say, hey, really like those databases, but I wish they were a little less reliable. I wish they scaled less. 
So those are the types of investments that we make every year. We really want our investment and that operational aspect to be indistinguishable, indistinguishable from perfect. All right, so as far as other breakouts, um, you know, there's, there's topics. You can do a deep dive on a number of these systems you saw. Let it be Neptune, the Ledger. I'm just listing some of them here with Elastic Cash, so on and so forth. Uh, know that Purpose Built is really about taking this big app, breaking it into smaller parts, picking the right tool for the right job. So we appreciate your time and energy. We know you have a lot of choices of sessions to go to, and please help us uh, improve. So if you can take the time to fill out that survey, we would appreciate it. So we'll meet folks up front to take questions. Thank you.